everyone, welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, the DPRK's top leader will meet South Korea's president in a historic third summit in April. That's at least according to the latest plan. Could this be the diplomatic breakthrough for the lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula? And I picked the brains of the economist and CPPCP member Lee Dao Kui about China's trade policies and the experience of being a reformer in China in tonight's straight talk from the two sessions. So let's begin our program today in Seoul, where South Korea announced a summit with Pyongyang at the demilitarized zone next month. The announcement comes following the arrival home of a South Korean delegation after meeting with the DPRK leader Kim Jong-un and other officials in the DPRK capital. Let's take a look at what exactly happened and what stood it to be a breakthrough in inter-Korea diplomacy. After returning to Seoul, the leader of South Korea's delegation to Pyongyang announced plans for a summit between DPRK leader Kim Jong-un and the South's President Moon Jae-in to be held at the demilitarized zone. It would only be the third ever meeting held between leaders of the two Koreas. The South and North Korea will hold the third summit at Peace House in Panmunjom in late April. For this, we agreed to hold working-level talks. A hotline is also to be established between the two leaders so they can speak ahead of the summit about de-escalating tensions on the peninsula. Having expected to meet senior officials in Pyongyang, South Korea's special delegation instead found themselves wined and dined for more than four hours by none other than DPRK leader Kim Jong-un and his wife. And it appeared President Donald Trump's preconditions for talks between Pyongyang and Washington had been met. North Korea made clear point of view for denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula and said there was no need to keep its nuclear program as long as there was no military threat against it and the safety of its regime was secured. Though the breakthrough diplomacy does not mean there won't be trouble ahead. South Korea's President Moon Jae-in has reiterated his call for even deeper inter-Korean dialogue while at the same time calling for stronger military cooperation with the United States, saying there can be no lasting peace without strong military power. Large-scale war games between South Korea and the United States have been postponed until after the Winter Paralympics, though they are then scheduled to resume. That could provoke a response from Kim Jong-un, who, according to the South delegation, has promised not to test nuclear or conventional weapons as long as talks are continuing. So, talks between Seoul and Pyongyang, really? That is a ray of hope or merely a smoke screen? I'm sure that question has been considered a lot by the three guests we're going to talk to. First of all, in Beijing, Zhao Tong, a fellow in the Carnegie Nuclear Policy Program based at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Welcome, sir. Also joining us in Kuala Lumpur is Yun Zhang Lim, Assistant Professor of the College of International Relations here with a university in in the country. However, she's originally coming from South Korea. And also in Washington, D.C., we invited Douglas Paul, Vice President of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Even though the two of you are colleagues, I'm sure you have very different opinions. So let me begin with the opinions coming from <laughs> South Korea. Ms. Lin, how much shall we trust the indirect quote coming from the South Korean delegation, who, which went to at the North Korean capital and said the North is willing to talk to the United States and denuclearize as long as there is security guarantee. How much should we trust this indirect quote? Okay, thank you for <coughs> the um, asking very direct, uh, explicit, simple question to me first. Um, again, uh, of course we always have to be fully cautious 
uh, because uh, North Korean regime, as we all know, it has been unpredictable. It has been less trustable compared to very normal countries. So uh, I hope I mean, we can fully uh, cautious about the real, again, the meaning of all this wording. But at least I uh, feel very much optimistic about uh, his that kind of you know, vocabulary, the wording this time. Okay. Because um, he clearly showed that um, he, yeah, he is, again, willing to um, come to the table uh, to start the dialogues with the counterparts, with the key counterparts in the Washington, D.C. Mm. So I, again, uh, of course, we have to be cautious, but at the same time, I'm optimistic. Uh, uh -huh. Cautiously optimistic, probably that's the way to sum it up. But the development between Seoul and Pyongyang was welcomed in the U.S. to a certain extent. Uh, Donald Trump tweeted this. Take a look at this. Possible progress being made with North Korea. First time in many years, serious effort made by all parties concerned. That's coming from the U.S. president, of course, through a tweet. But Mr. Paul, you really have very different opinions compared to his president. So let's go to Mr. Paul. What exactly is your judgment, sir? Is the U.S. willing to talk? Well, I think that I think the U.S. will have um, exploratory discussions that might lead to negotiations uh, and might not. There are new elements in what's happening since the Olympics. And there are very familiar, um, uh, disappointing kinds of elements that are also in the mix. The fact that the negotiators that went to North Korea are very experienced and reliable personalities makes me believe that we really have to give them credit. But we shouldn't overstate what Mr. Trump has said. He's, he's always looking for easy victories and claiming that our pressure tactics have worked is really getting the cart in front of the horse. It's been the, 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 new tech, the new sanctions are only a few months old, and to claim victory for those at this stage is too early. All right. And, and to be fair, Mr. Trump said it's, he needs to test it too. He doesn't know what the real result will be. All right. It seems that there are already two persons of skepticism expressed their opinions on our show so far. Let's go to the other side of this discussion, which, of course, is about the attitude coming from the Chinese side. Chinese Foreign Ministry said that today China hoped interaction between Pyongyang and Seoul could lead to talks between the DPRK and the U.S. Foreign Ministry spokesperson praised the dialogue between the DPRK and South Korea during the Pyongyang Games, calling it a hard-won momentum for easing tensions on the peninsula. We have always upheld the view that the interaction between the two sides of the DPRK and the ROK should be expanded to other parties, including the interaction between the DPRK and the United States. At present, the efforts to improve DPRK-ROK relations should be expanded to the common endeavor for realizing denuclearization and lasting peace on the peninsula. China is at all times ready to make its due efforts and display a positive road to this end. How should we interpret this? A lot of uh, wonderful, constructive words being used. Uh, Mr. Zhao, how do you feel about China's attitude and feeling so far? I think China is very pleased to see the most relevant players starting to talk with each other directly. Mm -hmm. And China has long believed that's the fundamental way to resolve their differences. Uh, and I think China is willing to help on the side. Uh, China is ha uh, happy to promote diplomacy behind closed doors. Mm. Uh, on the other side, there is concern that China might relax some of the sanctions given the positive attitude of North Korea recently. But I think that concern is unfounded as long as existing UN Security Council resolutions exist. I don't mm. think China would uh, significantly relax its sanction measures against North Korea. That's at exactly, all. or at least somewhat, the South Korean president also said, uh, uh, according to the latest report, Ms. Lim, um, he said that South Korea still continues to continue with the sanction mode, uh, not necessarily until uh, to change it until the real denuclearization happens. But you know, there are a lot of things that is not clear. There are a lot of spaces between words that can be maneuvered, at least for some negotiation possibilities. So the question is, Ms. Lim, how much will the South Korea be and still holding its current position, not change a bit? How much is it moving, let's just say, toward the earlier practice possibly, even though South Korea denied it, saying there's no under-the-table discussion between the North and South, there's no money 
provided to the North as a result of the Liddy discussion. Ms. Lim. Yes, I um, hear um, you know there's uh, voices from other panelists and from you too. Of course, we also we also are pretty much cautious, and uh, we also experienced kind of you know being betrayed by uh, our North Korean counterpart before. Um, so, which means that uh, we, of course, now we learned empirically. We learned from our own experience that we cannot this time. We should not be too naive. I mean, uh, and on the table with uh. the North Korea. But again, as I emphasized earlier, again, um, as long as they showed uh, those will, I mean, the strong wills to uh, sit on the table to start the dialogues, I think it pretty much depends on, on what uh, we can do together in the future. I mean, my point is, my, my answer to your death specification is, of course, is open too, because we, we didn't start the uh, uh, negotiation yet. We only saw uh, kind of, you know, very positive signs, right. uh, which does tell many things, but at the same time, it doesn't actually tell uh, everything. So it's again, the pretty much depend on the, the future negotiations. And uh, again, um, okay. my probably answer will be almost like a remain similar. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Paul, answer. you know, there, the yes. test is coming because early April, likely there's going to be joint military exercise as usual between South Korea and the United States. Today we learned through the media that the North suggested to the South, according to the South delegation, that the North will not raise an issue with it, but we do not know whether it is the real meaning coming from the North or the South has manipulated to a certain extent, and we don't know what exactly is the meaning of not raise an issue. So, Mr. Paul, is that going to be the latest test? Well, it will be the first test. Once the exercises start, um, we'll see how the North reacts. Uh, I assume that uh, the Two the two envoys from South Korea reported accurately what they heard, and therefore the North has, has recognized that some exercises will occur. Uh, they probably would like them to be smaller and less threatening looking exercises. Uh, there was a one report that said that they also do not want to see a second set of exercises following that, that they, because these have been postponed to April, they'll tolerate that, but go on uh, later on to uh, try to limit those exercises. Um, this, again, this is a new element, much as Kim Jong-un personally receiving the envoys and, and laying right. on uh, friendly photography and all of that's the new part. But the hard part is the exercises, the build-up uh, build of military capabilities and the, um, the hair-trigger nature of the confrontation on the peninsula. But on the other hand, Mr. Paul, there seems to be nothing to lose for the United States right now because if that is the case, the joint military exercise will still go on and U.S. could still, as some wanted to be, at preparing for any possibility in the military mean toward the DPRK, even though not many is welcoming that effort. And also at the same time, the U.S. Well, could also th wait for, could also uh, just embrace a future opportunity after the North-South uh, head of state meeting one another uh, for a future negotiation with the North. So it seems that the U.S. is the winner? Well, I, that, that may seem like the situation now, but everybody is trying to look as if he will not be the party responsible for the failure of the upcoming talks. Mm. So you want to appear bl obliging, you want to show that you're not out just to promote tension for tension's sake, and at the same time, you don't want to let your guard down and find yourself uh, betrayed by the other parties. Okay. Moreover, the North has had the long-term long ambition to split Washington and Seoul in their alliance. And if the U.S. mismanages this, or Seoul mismanages this, we could end up with more tensions between Seoul and Washington than before, and that would be playing to North Korea's advantage. So Here. there are a lot of places where losses can take place. Mm. Here's the thing, Mr. Zhao. What has really changed? Have we seen real change, in fact? I mean, okay, there's a delegation from the south to the north. There's a discussion. There's a big banquet, four hours long. There is some takeaway of indirect quotes coming from the south delegation about the north. There is a lot of nuances going on, and yet n none of these nuances at this point suggest any concrete change for the better. Where are we now, Mr. Zhao, your judgment here? Well, in fact, I think there is concrete change. Uh, Go ahead. What is it? 
Well, if the uh, description about the meeting uh, from the North South Korean envoy was accurate, uh, North Koreans made two important concessions. One is Kim Jong-un, the su supreme leader, explicitly com committed to the ultimate goal of denuclearization. If I recall correctly, North Korea has not done that explicitly and at such a high level since Kim Jong-un came into power. Second major concession from North Korea was North Korea offered to suspend missile tests and nuclear tests as long as negotiations with the United States continue. Mm. I think that's concrete uh, concession. That's far from being uh, ideal, far from being uh, achieving the entire goal of the United States, but that can be the starting point. All right. At this point, how shall we judge the nature of the water? Mr. Paul, how much is the U.S. willing to talk directly to the North? And what is going to be the bottom line? Of course, you're not coming from the White House. And because of that, you could tell us what could be the bottom line, Mr. Paul. Well, I, I wish I could tell you that. Um, Why not? We, uh, as, you know, as, as, as somebody who works in this Washington environment, I have uh, not in my lifetime seen us less prepared in terms of personnel and policy to enter into these negotiations. Uh, we have a lot of straightening out to do on what our priorities are in the U.S. I, we have, of course, said we want maximum pressure and be open to negotiations. All right. But that's just a posture. It doesn't tell you what we actually will try to achieve. And who will be the negotiator? Who has the experience? I mean, the North Koreans will have 30 years but of that's looking across the issue. table. That, that, that's a tactical counterpart. issue. What about the commitment? There, no, there are two categories of issues. It's more than a tactical issue. There, there are tactical issues, there are strategic issues, and process and personnel are always important right. in achieving them. And in this particular administration, you can see the chaos coming out of the White House. Okay. It's very hard to know uh, how things are going to play out and what the priorities really are. So you are, you are not having much confidence in the next step that the U.S. could take. Uh, let's go to Ms. Lim. Um, what about the South? How strong is that partnership with the United States? Uh, what is going to be the thing that the South, when seeing it, is likely to change its attitude overall toward the North? Ms. Lim, what is it? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I appreciate uh, the other panelists, uh, Dr. Pell's that comments. Uh, it does look like the Washington, and uh, more specifically speaking, White House, the Trump administration, doesn't look like um, to have a like, kind, of, kind of clear goal or clear vision or consensus owed, uh, on the uh, how to deal with North Korea. Even though, of course, denuclearization has been the priority, mm -hmm. no matter what happened, but that's another, like, uh, another front reason. But behind that, the front reason, what will be the real priority uh, from the Trump administration point of view, it's unclear. I got but it. here, more important thing is, again, as I mentioned, again, the, uh, the Moon Jae-in, he was the chief of the uh, secretary under the, uh, his predecessor, uh, Prezes, uh, President Roh Moo-hyun, which means he learned already. He learned already from the uh, experience uh, between the Roh Moo-hyun administration and right. the George W. Bush uh, administration, which does uh, provide, I think, a good understandings, uh, strong, solid backgrounds for his own understandings about the alliance or or the dialogues or partnership Got with it. the White House. So that is why uh, I can be more optimistic this time. I do see a strong bonding and uh, intimate uh, dialogues between the White House and the Blue House. All right. Uh, confused, but at the same time confident. Uh, South Korea, it seems. Uh, let's go to last but not least, uh, Mr. Zhao. China, what's likely to be the prospect? One minute if you can, sir. Well, um, I think uh, China will continue to try to facilitate uh, diplomacy uh, on the sideline. Uh, China is happy that itself is not in the center of the limelight. Um, <laughs> China has been in that position for a long time, taking uh -huh. on the pressure. I think China feels relieved to some extent and feel very much encouraged uh, by the willingness of the most relevant parties to engage directly with each other. All right. Um, I think I don't see China, you know, wanting to insert itself at this moment into the center of the discussions. But I think China wants to keep close 
coordination with South Korea, with the United States, and maybe with North Korea as well, right, okay. trying to offer its advice if necessary. Mr. Powell is scratching his head, trying to figure out what exactly that meant. But anyway, for now, <laughs> I want to wrap up this conversation. It is a good day to a certain extent. We'll see how things are going. For now, thank you so much, Zhao Tong, Yuan Zhang Lim, and Douglas Paul. Thank you so much for being with us. All the best. Stay with us here on World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program. Tsinghua economist and CPPCC member Li Daohui shares his expert views about the speed of China's reforms and his own experience as someone who is exercising reforms in this country. In tonight's great talk from the two sessions that happened today. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Now let's go to Straight Talk. Yes, that's both the name and the style of our exclusive interview series featuring big names coming from all walks of life in China. A person, a talk, a day during the ongoing political season. Today, let's meet Li Da Hui, one of the best known Chinese economists in the world. He articulated the recent trade tensions between China and the U.S. He also spoke frankly to me about the nature of China's challenges in carrying out the latest reforms. But he said that no one could ever halt the tide of reform because that's what the Chinese really see eye to eye on. Let's do some reality check first and listen to what he has to say. We need great steel makers, great aluminum makers for defense. U.S. President Donald Trump has long promised trade tariffs and is now moving to impose them. A 25% global tariff or tax on imports of steel and 10% on aluminum. Allies and neighbors of the U.S. will be hit the hardest. China isn't among the top 10. It's 11th. But Chinese products like aluminum foil imports have already been targeted. And the Trump White House is indicating more moves against Beijing on investment, intellectual property and technology transfers. The U.S. is also moving to block more foreign investment in the U.S. At this week's National People's Congress in Beijing, Premier Li Keqiang said Beijing was committed to open trade but would also defend itself. And after U.S. President Trump's state visit plus last November, China committed itself to further opening up its financial and insurance industries. But the problem for China and other big trading partners with the U.S. is that the Trump administration may not be satisfied with just imposing tariffs. China-U.S. trade war, is it a possibility? It's not a war, it's a battle. The Chinese side will and should retaliate in a very precise way to let the U.S. President Trump know that China is not ready to accept whatever bully the U.S. side is giving. But Professor, when you look at the history of economic discussions, so sometimes debates and probably run into wars, if we could use that word, um, in history, does it help anyone? One country, especially a large one like the U.S., uh, initiates a big, big uh, trade war. The whole world will suffer. Mm. The Great Recession before World War II started exactly uh, by the U.S. congressmen's uh, unilateral trade policy against European countries. And that triggered a trade war. We triggered financial crisis, we triggered a big re recession, we triggered later on the World War II. China is talking about reducing the financial risks for the next three years. That's going to be one of the most important battles China is going to fight within the country in order to guarantee a good life for its people. But what if the international environment is getting ever more harsh? For example, trade. What does that mean for China? Well, uh, the f trade and the finance for China uh, so far have been relatively isolated mm. because in China trade uh, is a big source of uh, surplus of inflow of foreign currency but the, f the amount of inflow of foreign currency is decreasingly unimportant mm. not nearly as important as before it used to be that China earns around um, around something around three, four hundred billion U.S. dollars a year from trade surplus. Nowadays, that number reduces to something around 200 or even 150 
But don't forget the Chinese economy is getting bigger and bigger. Last year, the Chinese GDP reached uh, the, the, uh, the amount of uh, 12 trillion US dollar mm -hmm. in comparison with the US 19 trillion, 19 trillion. So, relatively speaking, trade is less important today for the Chinese economy as it was 10 years ago. Compared to the United States, China is still going to be the bigger loser because China is still having this export oriented to a certain extent uh, economic model. Uh, to some extent that's true. Nobody is a winner when there's a trade war. China today is much less vulnerable than 10 years ago to trade war. Mm. And also, mm. I don't think China is initiating a trade war. Rather, to the contrary, I believe the Chinese government will come out telling the European Union, telling the, U, the U.S. Uh, 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 companies that China is willing to stand up against the President mm. Trump's policies of trade war. China will become a, a kind of um, a pillar, a pillar of today's global uh, governance in today's uh, uh, strong wave. Whether the International Business Committee is still willing to stand by China's side, for example, as they did years ago when there was another debate about trade. Uh, for now, there has been complaints coming from the international trading community about uh, whether China is continuing to commit to the opening up policy. Of course, Chinese policy officially it is, but when it comes to specific regulation, there seems to be concerns. Secondly, we heard from the spokesperson from the National People's Congress talking about three foreign investment laws and regulations likely to be combined into one basic one. So nobody knows where the water is going to flow at this point, according to the foreign investors coming into China. So do you think there's going to be still a big team of sympathizers towards China if there is further debate about trade? Local Chinese firms are much more competitive against foreign companies. So as a result, foreign companies are complaining about China, not necessarily about the policy, but about the old market. It's not as easy today as before making money in China. Let's face, let's face it. And also, multinationals, whether they are complaining against Chinese policy or not, are still on the same side of China. Of, of China. China, as I said, is trying to prevent the current policy from the U.S. Uh, from escalating into a trade war. So in this regard, the Chinese policy, the Chinese government and the multinationals are on the same boat. Reform and opening up, that's what China has been doing over the past 40 years. That's also why China has become what it is today. But going forward, will the country still have the guts to press ahead with the reform agenda with unwavering resolve and precision? I asked Professor Li Daokui about that too, with a direct question. There has been different views about reforms. Mm -hmm. Some say it's not necessarily in the speed to the satisfaction of most. Others say, well, there has to be a steady growth of these policies and steady implementations of these policies. What do you think, Professor? Let's compare China's reform to the construction of a building. Mm -hmm. Right after 40 years of construction, this building is already pretty much having taken its shape. However, the internal decoration that re now requires very detailed work, painstaking details, are now the task of reforms. So therefore, the reforms today seem to be slower mm -hmm. than it was 40 years ago or 30 years ago, because the nature of the progress of the construction of this house of the modern economy in China. So I wouldn't necessarily say that China is lacking commitment to reform or reform slows down. Rather, every piece of reform in mm. China today involves more thinking, more debates, more deliberation, more research mm. than before. The so-called deep water. Exactly. And I call it detailed painting. And after the 19th uh, Party Congress, mm -hmm. and also after this upcoming National People's Congress, reform will speed up because, because the basic personnel decisions mm -hmm. will be settled. For the next five years. For the next five years. And these per all these personnel decisions more or less 
are in line with the ideas of uh, the top leadership in China. Mm. What do you mean by that from an economic uh, scholar's perspective? In economic terms, I do believe that the reform in, financial, in the financial sector will speed, up, will speed up, for example, the structure of financial regulation right. will be consolidated. Even though I do not know the details, but I'm pretty comfortable in predicting that that the whole regu regulatory structure mm. will be consolidated, will be streamlined, will be strengthened, mm. right? Because the Chinese financial sector is now very multidimensional. One enterprise actually is doing many, many things. That's right. The financial firms are doing multiple things. We right. call universal banking, whereas the regulators are still very specialized. There's a mismatch. Mm. When you look at China's structure, at least the governance structure, Local central government relations is still one of the most important. Earlier, Professor, you know better than I do. We learned the news that some of the local numbers when it comes to GDP have been cooked for years, and therefore people put a question mark about China's exact growth rate. What about the picture now? With the starting point, as we say, in a new era, are things really likely to be that different? Local enterprises are now given different sets of incentives. Before, they were pretty much um, simply motivated to, to have GDP, to, to have economic growth, to have faster GDP growth. Mm. Now, they are given a multi-task, multi-dimensional task. Multi task. Uh, not only economic growth, uh, but more important, the, the, the increase in living standard, mm -hmm. the improvement of the environment, and uh, R&D. Uh, so on and so forth. So I do believe that the local leaders are now very different. Mm -hmm. I've been traveling around in China I've s in recent months. Mm -hmm. I've seen tremendous change, tremendous change in the mentality of local officials. Give me an example, Professor. For example, I just came from a big, big uh, city in the province of Shandong mm -hmm. with a population almost 10 million. 10 million, okay? It's not the capital of Shandong, but it's one of the largest cities in Shandong. Right. And the mayor who invited me to go there. Mm. He uh, spends lots of energy and his uh, time to one topic. He's been also asking me about this topic, how to change the engine mm. of economic growth from simply making investments mm. in infrastructure to... Or real estate, to, to say the least. <laughs> to sustainable investments to prop up the local R&D. Mm. And also, he says, educated population. Therefore, the industry in the city will be able to upgrade. Mm. There has been concern whether countries, including China and others, there will be rise of nationalism. So when you have pressure coming from outside, it's predictable nationalism would arise in the country. So how would that work eventually on the economic policies and on the way of reform? It's an interesting question, isn't it? If you look countries after countries in today's world, starting from the U.S., Right? President Trump. Don't you see that as nationalism? U.S. first, America first, right? As simple as that. But that has not been well received by the rest of the world, by That's the way, Professor. But domestically, domestic, the, the president elected by the U.S. population, right? Uh, by the U.S. voters, is in, inward-looking, nationalistic. Mm. The nationalism is the trend of today's world. The Chinese government, including Chinese, you know, represented by Chinese leaders, right? are always, always trying to balance nationalism with a global commitment, mm -hmm. right? When, when President Xi Jinping says the China dream, he also says the common destiny. Mm. The community of shared future for... Exactly. He always has double two messages. The two messages are combined. Mm -hmm. That is, how to make China great again is through China being able to make more contribution to the rest of the world, unlike the past 500 years. In the past, past 500 years, not only China slowed down as a country in making progress, but also China slowed down as a country making contribution to the rest of the world. Mm. So today's message from China, I think, is super clear. It is super clear. It is about reform, isn't it? When it comes to reform, Professor Li is a product of the practice of his own and has a story to tell once asked about it. Take a listen as to what he has to say. 
you are one of those products in a way, quote unquote. That is 40 years of reform and China's opening up, right? You were a Chinese student, and then you went overseas, you studied there in the United States, became a professor, worked there, comfortable life, but then you thought there's something better and bigger to be done, and you came back. You t teach at Tsinghua University, you try to establish the first ever institution on the Chinese university campus between Chinese and foreign, uh, in a way, joint efforts. So you knew how it was like to be someone coming from outside, coming back, and also to be a reformer in this process. The big takeaway from this 40-year anniversary of the reform is very, very simple. That is, continue the process and let the process not only benefit the Chinese people, but also the rest of the world. But you yourself, Professor Li, is a reformer too. I'm a big, big supporter of reform. Mm. And you did your own projects too. I Whether it is project. your center of research or it's establishing an institute on the campus of Tsinghua. Reform is a mentality. Truly, reform is a mentality. Every day, in everything I have to implement the reform. For example, I've been teaching a course for 14 years an undergraduate course. Every year I have to innovate. And I told students, if I don't innovate, if I don't do reform, somebody will, who is much more eloquent, much more knowledgeable, much more, much better looking than myself, <laughs> will do I'm a not video sure teaching. We'll do a video, we'll do, a, you know, video, we'll do the internet learning. No, who am I? I will, I will be replaced. So that's why in my teaching, especially recent years, I always, always do reform. So in my current teaching, I reverse it. I let students first, rep first present the teaching material. Mm -hmm. I give them VVT beforehand, and that make comments. That way, I believe I cannot be easily replaced. <laughs> so this is an example of reform. Not reform by artificial intelligence. That reforms <laughs> mentality. I do believe that the, the reform as a mentality is deeply, deeply rooted in China. But you also know the challenge of being a reformer. Of course. Because of course. you try to set up an institute on Tsinghua University campus, and it takes years. Yeah. And of course, you always encounter with challenges that could be part of the fun, you could argue, yeah. but at the same time, it is challenging. It's challenging because, number one, you have to be patient. Number two, you really, really, really have to think from the other people's perspective. You have to make sure potential losers are properly taken care of, right? You can imagine, you might be a loser of, the re of any reform any process. Any reform. Right? You, you, feel, you feel very uncomfortable. So any successful reform uh, has to, right, has to overcome the uh, obstacles from the, from the potential losers. And I, my belief is not to wipe them out. But Rather, you have, you have to find a way to make them comfortable. But is the baggage to too heavy? Well, reform that by definition is that we have a bigger pie. We have a bigger pie. We have a bigger, right, bigger economy, more efficiency. So we're, we should be able to afford to compensate the potential loser. Maybe it's a better word. Potential, potential. Uh, uh, Those interests that are being right? challenged. That's mm. right. Mm. But how patient can you be? Do well, you need to be as a reformer? In China, we have a saying that uh, 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 being slow is not a problem. The problem is to stop, right? If you keep on moving, keep on, keep on moving, you eventually will get there. Some example in Beijing traffic. If in Beijing traffic in a crossroad, if you stop, you never go cross because it's so busy. They are, they are, they are, they are bicycles, they are uh, passengers, they are right, pedestrians. They, they're always cutting our way, right? So what you do in Beijing's crossroads, if you, you have to gradually move, 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 right? Then people would yield to you. All right. If you, you run you too fast, you, you run too fast, you have accident. If if stands still, you never come across. Well, you ride a wonderful motorcycle in Beijing, so I would believe <laughs> you. <laughs> what That's you right. have just said. Yeah. Looking ahead, it's not going to be easy, to say the least, Professor. And China will be in the water that it has never been before. So. What kind of mes mindset, Professor, do you think, whether it's the leadership or the common folks, academics in China, from your perspective, need to have? 
Number one. And hold it dear. Number one, a sense of uh, urgency, a, a sense of um, um, uh, crisis, maybe too strong word, mm. a sense of needs uh, of continued reform. Mm -hmm. Right. That's very, very important. Number two, be global. Always keep in mind that China is big enough, huge enough, so anything Chinese essentially is global. Mm -hmm. So we also have to take foreigners or people in the rest of the world's interest into account. Mm -hmm. We have to understand their mentality, we have to understand their interest. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally I believe that China's growth, China's continued progress will also benefit the rest of the world. Professor Lee, it's always a great pleasure having you on our program. All the best as a reformer. My <laughs> honor, my pleasure. Thank you so Thank much, you. Professor. Thank you. Professor Li Daokui, one well-known Chinese economist in the world. He's part of our interview series, Straight Talk, right here on World Inside with Tianwei during the two sessions. Tomorrow, we are going to hear from Zhang Qiyue, China's Consul General in New York, on fresh efforts of China's diplomacy in the making. Well, that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. And tune in again tomorrow for insights across China and around the world. Good night.